Good afternoon, everyone, and I want to thank the organizers uh, of the very first Siliman University Medical Center virtual convention. Thank you for that kind introduction. Today, I'm going to talk about something that's interesting in the field of endocrinology. We're going to talk about thyroid function tests, and later on, we're going to talk about thyroid emergencies, in particular, thyroid storm, as well as myxedema coma. So let's start. So this is the title of the talk, Deciphering Thyroid Function Tests and Managing Thyroid Emergencies, Essentials on Understanding Thyroid Disease Management. So this is my disclosure slide. I'm going to begin by talking about the PhilTides, which is the Philippine Thyroid Disease Study. And uh, this particular study was done sometime in 2014. Uh, this is a very important study because essentially this is the very first study that gave us the prevalence of thyroid disease in the Philippine population, which is about 7 to 8%. This is similar to our prevalence of diabetes as well uh, in our population. Now, interestingly, there are very important data here that we can pick up from this study. First, they studied about 4,897 patients uh, for the normal patients, which is a majority of the members that were included in this study. Most of them had an average of FT4 of about 1.05 and a TSH of 1.9. Interestingly, the, among the subsets of abnormal tests, you will notice that the subclinical hyperthyroidism and subclinical hypothyroidism was present in some of the patients, far more than those with the true hyperthyroidism and true hypothyroidism. On the other parts of the study, you will also notice that they have established that the different grades of goiter did establish certain values that we can use in understanding our population, and that the mean T4 actually went up for those with uh, higher grades of uh, goiter, and the mean TSH actually went down with those that had a grade 2 over grade 0 or grade 1. Also, the distribution of patients with goiter showed that true hyperthyroidism was present in 52.82% and that true hypothyroidism was about 15.68%. So these are very important uh, data that we need to remember. Now, when we talk about the axis of the thyroid, you're talking about three levels. You have the hypothalamus that produces your TS TRH that is sent to your pituitary. Pituitary produces your TSH that acts on the thyroid gland, which produces your T4 and T3. Remember, there is a short loop negative feedback mechanism uh, from your thyroid uh, hormones that goes back to your uh, pituitary, and then a long loop negative feedback that also sends signal to your hypothalamus. And therefore, the production of your TSH is controlled as well as your TSH, TRH as well. Now, let's look at the graphic representation of this relationship. If you notice here that in a normal individual, your TSH and T4 are normal. In a hyperthyroid patient, you have a low TSH and high T4. Now, because of the high T4, you send a signal to your pituitary, telling the pituitary to produce less TSH, and that's the reason why your TSH goes down. In a hypothyroid patient, you have low FT4 and FT3, and therefore you send a signal to the pituitary to produce more of the TSH, and that's why the TSH is high. In the case of secondary hypothyroidism, the problem is both at your level of your pituitary as well as the level of your thyroid gland, where you have both low TSH and low T4. Now, the question really is, are we using thyroid function tests appropriately? And this was the question that was posed in this study that was done in Punjab, India. Interestingly, uh, the data showed that, of course, it was internal medicine that had the most number of orders of thyroid function tests, followed closely by ob -GYN. The favorite combination was TSH plus T3 and plus T4. TSH alone was also very popular, the first set being 47.5, and the TSH alone 
follow closely at about 46. Now, interestingly, there were very different combinations as far as thyroid function test test results showed, however, that really most of these patients will have a normal result when you look at the thyroid function test. In fact, the combination of T4, T3, and TSH essentially had about 77.4% normal, and everybody else had a lower percentage, indicating that whether or not these tests were really appropriate to order or would it have been enough if it was only TSH that was ordered among these patients? Similar data was also shown here in this study done in San Antonio, Texas, in a military health system. So they looked at a considerable number of patients, about 38,000 patients. And let's look at the information here. Shown here is that the TSH study alone did detect more number of patients over that of the FT4 plus TSH. The other combinations are not as significant in picking up the levels of thyroid uh, abnormalities. And therefore, really the question of the combination of FT4 plus TSH or TSH would really appear to be a very significant uh, subset of uh, tests that you want to do with a lot of your suspected thyroid patients. This final study from um, Italy was done in the University Hospital in Parma. It showed that among those patients that were uh, had their TSH done, a lot of the patients, about 20.3%, actually had an abnormal test, and they were able to detect these patients with TSH alone. So other tests that were done did show some deficiency or some problems with the thyroid, however, not as significant as that of TSH. So, which gives us this question. Do we really need to get the whole thyroid function panel? So, essentially, what these studies are telling us is that if we look at the data from a lot of our patients, as well as the studies coming from abroad, a lot of them did detect the thyroid uh, deficiency or abnormality even with TSH and FT4. And perhaps... A more strategic way in testing for our patient is really what we want to do, especially with limited resources that we have in our country. This was taken from one of the journals that focus on thyroid function tests, and this was published by Colori et al. And this is a very important um, illustration of how your thyroid function tests will actually appear and what are the corresponding uh, pathologies that may uh, occur on these patients. Uh, it may be a little bit busy if you look at it, let's, but let's try to break this down. So at the center, you will notice that the FT4 and FT3 are actually normal. So that's very important because that establishes that a lot of the patients will actually fall on this particular uh, category. On top, you will see that there's elevation on your FT4 and FT3 with a reduction in your TSH. You often see this in hyperthyroid patients, regardless if the pathology is Graves' disease or toxic multinodular goiter. This may also occur in toxic adenoma or autonomously functioning nodule, thyroiditis, either post-viral or postpartum thyroiditis, and some of the medications, including excess iodine intake. Remember that amiodarone can cause hyperthyroidism, but as well, hypothyroidism. So if you have excess thyroid ingestion as well as um, derangements in your pregnancy-related hormone levels with hyperemesis gravidarum with a decrease in your TSH or H-mole, there's also a decrease in TSH because of the elevation of your beta HCG. This is also present in congenital hyperthyroidism. In contrast, on the bottom part, you will see that the FT4 and FT3 are decreased, but your TSH is increased, indicating you have overt hypothyroidism. So this can occur in Hashimoto's or atrophic uh, autoimmune thyroiditis, post-radiation therapy or post-thyroidectomy. You have a hypothyroid uh, phase of thyroiditis from an initial hyper. You have medications including amiodarone, lithium, you have the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, anti-thyroid medications, 
as well as iodine deficiency or excess. And you can have this in irradiation, thyroiditis, as well as the presence of tumor, either amyloid tissue may be present on these patients. And again, congenital hypothyroidism. So it's really a spectrum of diseases that can occur in uh, thyroid patients. So moving forward, let's look at the other components of this diagram. On the right side, you have a decrease in your FT4 and FT3 with a normal or decreased TSH that can occur in non-thyroidal illness or central hypothyroidism. You can also have isolated TSH deficiency or an assay interference. On the lower part, you will see an elevation of your FT4 and FT3 with normal TSH or elevated TSH. This can occur again in assay interference. You have a patient that had a tyrosine uh, replacement therapy, but uh, poorly compliant, and therefore your TSH has not responded well yet. You have drugs such as amiodarone, heparin, uh, of course, the neonate period. In certain cases, you may have rarely a TSH secreting pituitary adenoma or resistance to thyroid hormone, as well as disorders of thyroid hormone uh, transport. So essentially, you have an elevation of your FT4 and FT3 with a corresponding increase in the TSH when you would have expected that this would have gone down. On the opposite side, on the left side, you will see that FT4 here and FT3 are about normal, but you have a low TSH indicating subclinical hyperthyroidism. So this can also occur in patients that are being treated for hyperthyroidism, and the antithyroid medications are actually having its effect already but the decrease in TSH may also be because of steroids and dopamine. And of course, assay interference and non-thyroidal illness are part of the differential diagnosis for these type of patients. On the bottom part, on the left side, you will also see FT4 and FT3 within normal limits, but your TSH going up. So you now have subclinical hypothyroidism. This can occur in patients with poor compliance, with their medications with levothyroxine, malabsorption of uh, thyroxine, as well as amiodarone use. Of course, you have the assay interference, non-thyroidal illness in recovery, as well as TSH uh, resistance. We need to keep in mind that when we are interpreting a thyroid function test, it's very important to understand that what is the state of the patient, what is the clinical status of the patient, that is very significant in determining really what's going on with the patient. You also have to keep in mind that confounding factors may be present in this patient and that the assays are very important and you need to understand the different tests that you are actually getting for your patients and as well as the possible limitations of these tests. When you're doing screening, you need to remember also all the medications uh, as well as the situation that the patient is in. And of course, at some point, you will have to have some sort of referral to your friendly endocrinologist or your favorite endocrinologist within the area. This is an algorithm that I got from one of the studies. Um, this is from the Annals of Laboratory Medicine, and this is a sequential uh, follow-up or evaluation of the patient. You have a TSH here indicating that it may be high with an FT4 that is low, indicating that you have primary hypothyroidism. In the presence of high TSH, you are primarily considering a, a hypothyroid patient, but the FT4 being normal can indicate that this is a subclinical hypothyroidism. So you have several differential diagnoses here, which include iodine deficiency, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, previous radioactive treatment, or next surgery, essentially looking into the area of uh, hypothyroidism on the left side. If your FT4 is high on top of a elevated uh, TSH, you have to consider either an abnormality in your assay or uh, some of the rarer tumors such as THA oma or thyroid hormone resistance that may be present in this patient. Now, in the case of a low TSH with an FT4 that is also low, you're considering secondary hypothyroidism, and therefore your differential diagnosis will include 
pituitary tumor, previous pituitary surgery, or radiotherapy. If your FT4 is normal with low TSH, you are considering subclinical hyperthyroidism. Eventually, this may lead to primary hyperthyroidism, and therefore, your differentials will now be uh, along the lines of hyperthyroid patients with Graves' disease and toxic nodules, as well as thyroiditis. Now, keep in mind that the uh, evaluation of these patients will include uh, looking into other parameters, such as uh, imaging techniques, as well as further tests to identify whether or not you are dealing with more complex realizations with uh, thyroid disease. No? So you also need to keep in mind that a lot of these uh, tests need to be confirmed uh, in the background of some genetic abnormality. You do have familial dysalbuminomic hyperthyroxinemia. You have resistance to thyroid hormone, the allen hendon dudley syndrome, and selenoprotein deficiency disorders, which also shows you a distinct pattern in the thyroid function test that is shown here. Now, remember also, and I mentioned this earlier, that certain medications can affect your results, like iodine can decrease your FT4 and FT3 and increase your TSH and TRH. Radiographic contrast material can increase your FT4 but decrease your FT3 and then again increases your TSH and your TRH. Amiodarone can cause hyper or hypothyroid state and therefore it's really very important that you interpret it in the presence of this particular medication. So your phenytoin, carbamazepin, and phenobarbitone will also have an effect, generally a decrease of your free thyroid uh, hormones. Aspirin may also increase the release of your thyroid hormones, and therefore there is a concomitant increase in your FT4 as well as your FT3. Propanolol may generally decrease your free T3 but it can also increase partly the FT4. And so with steroids, they will have an effect of a reduction in your TSH and TRH, as well as that uh, of the use of dopamine, which will show you similar uh, manifestations in the thyroid uh, function test. So essentially, when you talk about thyroid function tests, you need to assess everything that's going on with the patient. And therefore, some of the doctors or some of the proponents uh, feel that you really have to take the thyroid function test in the context of what, we, what is really going on in the patient and that our interpretation is very important and that uh, we need to factor in that the levels may be different for different populations as well as the possibility of the effect of many of the confounding factors that may be present in the patient. So here, we need to do really clinical evaluation of the patient when we're trying to interpret the TSH FT4 and FT3 in any of the patients that we encounter in the clinics or even in the ward. So now let's talk about TSH or thyrotropin. So we all believe and even the experts will tell you that the TSH is the most important variable for the diagnosis of primary thyroid dysfunction, be it hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. But there's really no consensus as far as the uh, cutoff levels in some of the populations, and therefore, often it is population-based, and that's why it's very important that we have a reference guide on what the normal TSH is for uh, our uh, country. You know? So that's very important. And that's why we go back to field tides, which showed to us that our TSH on the average should be around 1.9 for non-pregnant uh, women and about 1.05. So these are very important numbers that we use as reference. Again, the TSH uh, is very important. Of course, when we, we study the TSH as well as the other thyroid function tests, we do some uh, evaluations, and the assays that we use may be isotope methods or it may be non-isotope methods, and therefore you will hear the terms of RIA, IRMA, ELISA, as well as that of LIA. So these are the different isotopes that uh, are available, and we use them uh, to test for thyroid function tests, in particular your TSH, FT4, and FT3. There are other factors that can affect your results. We talk about some of them, and here you can see drugs as well as diseases that can increase your TSH. Very prominent here is the uh, dopamine receptor antagonist. You also have amphetamine, 
as well as H2 receptor blockers and iodine. All of these substances can actually increase your TSH. And for diseases, for a hypothyroid state, you can have this in uh, your adrenal insufficiency with Addison's disease, cirrhosis, malaria, as well as malignancies. For factors that can decrease your TSH or put them in a hyperthyroid state, again, there are several drugs. You have dopamine, dopamine receptor agonists, you have thyroid hormones, as well as opioids. You also have interferon alpha. And for diseases, you have depression, Cushing's disease, acromegaly, and renal failure, as well as other renal diseases that may be present in these patients. So when we talk about assays, there's been significant developments as far as testing of TSH is concerned. You used to have the first-generation TSH in 1960s, which used competitive binding with one polyclonal antibody and the right radio isotope label. Functionality was about 1% to 2% in terms of sensitivity, milli-IU. This has improved significantly between 1970s to 1980s, whereby they now use the sandwich immunoassays with uh, polyclonal antibodies binding to a couple of epitopes. You now have a functional sensitivity of 0.1 to 0.2. And more recently, the third-generation TSH immunoassays, which now are enhanced specifically and more sensitive to thyroid function tests with a sensitivity of 0.01 to 0.02. Once again, I cannot overemphasize the effect of many of the diseases and substances that may affect the results of your thyroid function test. Remember also that uh, the results may not be as accurate in patients with central hypothyroidism or some sort of pituitary disorder. Uh, in the case of stress as well as general medical condition, non-thyroidal illness or thyroid syndrome may give you a falsely elevated or low TSH among these patients. You also have uh, other factors such as treatment uh, for thyrotoxicosis or even for hypothyroidism that can affect the level of your TSH. Of course, the rare causes of abnormalities in your TSH include resistance to thyroid hormone as well as the presence of very rare tumors. So. Um, these are very important factors that uh, you need to consider when you're trying to in interpret your thyroid function test. But indeed, the TSH is perhaps the most important test that you can do for a lot of the patients to give you an idea of really what's going on with your patient. And therefore, the initial screening test for a lot of the doctors and specialists is really just to get a TSH, especially if you're following the sequential path into identifying what the thyroid problem is of the patient is. So what about T4 and T3? So these are also very important tests, often complementary to your TSH. In the case of T4, this is often uh, in the free form, which you measure the unbound T4 that enters the affected uh, body tissues. You also have the T4 test, which includes the bound and unbound component of your T4. So these are very important uh, tests that you can do that will complement your TSH. You also have your T3 or total T3. Total T3, again, encompasses the bound and unbound component. Uh, normally, you, you check the T3 to find out whether or not you are having some sort of T3 toxicosis. No? The free T3 is less reliable, but it may also be used to follow patients with thyroid disorders. And let's look at some of the uh, important data as far as this is concerned, of course, the serum T3 primarily, as I mentioned, looking into the possibility of hyperthyroidism uh, together with your T4. Even if your T4 is uh, normal with a low TSH, you can get your T3 to find out whether you are in a hyperthyroid state because of elevations in T3 rather than that of T4. Of course, when you are on uh, treatment for persistent uh, T3 excess, you follow this, you, you use this test to see the progress of your patients. In, in cases where you have a amiodarone induced hyperthyroidism, uh, you can also use both the T4 and T3 to follow these patients, and especially for those patients that will require frequent follow-up. And uh, in some cases, you have to follow uh, four uh, the non-thyroidal illness. 
So talking about non-thyroidal illness or thyroid syndrome, as you can see here in the image, in the initial phase, there is really a dip in your T3 in the milder cases of uh, thyroid syndrome. But as you move on to more severe cases, your T3 dips even more. But notice that even your free T4 as well as your T4 can also go down and slightly recover as your patient recovers from the medical condition. The TSH remains within range, but it may go up a little bit in the recovery phase, and reverse T3 will uh, always be on the upper side, uh, essentially showing the profile of the patient with sick thyroid syndrome here. You also notice that the, the rise and dip of these hormones are often temporary, and therefore treatment is not necessary. So for most of these patients, we just follow them up and uh, do repeat uh, thyroid function tests to check whether they have recovered. There are certain patterns that you want to consider when you look at the thyroid function test. Essentially, all of these uh, thyroid function tests should be normal. But here you see a lot of the uh, tests showing derangements. So in particular, when you have euthyroid hyperthyroxinemia, we have a normal TSH with an elevation in your FT4, or euthyroid hypothyroxinemia with a decrease in T4 despite of your uh, normal TSH. All the other derangements may come in uh, certain forms like the primary hyper and hypothyroidism, indicating that um, your problem is in the primary organ, which is your thyroid. And of course, you have some derangements already at the level of the hypothalamus as well as the pituitary. So both set of T4 as well as free T4 and total and free T3 really complement your TSH results. And often, you may need one of any of these combinations to help you identify whether or not you're dealing with an excess or a deficiency of your thyroid hormone. This is in an algorithm taken from the Mayo Clinic. If you'll notice here, they usually start off with a TSH. And depending on the level of the TSH, the next step will, will really be focused on your FT4. And only in the presence of hyperthyroidism do they consider uh, testing for T3 or, for that matter, FT3. So in the case of patients with elevated TSH of more than 4.2, they also look into the possibility of autoimmune uh, diseases that cause the hypothyroidism and therefore they test for TPO antibodies or for that matter, antithyroglobulin. Notice that um, one of the warnings that they showed here is that vitamin B7 is also a confounding factor for a lot of the assays that we use when we test for thyroid function tests. So we need to remember that as we interview our patients. So generally, those with biotin may have some sort of effect on the results of your thyroid function test. Now, the approach to thyroid function tests may vary from a lot of our patients uh, and a lot of the physicians for that matter. The minimalist approach technically will use the TSH as the initial test that you want to do. If it's normal, uh, you don't need to do further testing. If you have an elevated uh, TSH or, for that matter, low TSH, you can get your free T4 and then probably proceed to T3 if you have a low TSH already in consideration of hyperthyroidism. The broader approach will now include uh, other tests that uh, will look into pituitary and hypothalamic diseases, as well as considerations in the clinical manifestation of the patient, whether or not hyper or hypothyroidism may be present despite the normal uh, TSH. So I think that the practical approach to preliminary thyroid disease evaluation may vary from a lot of the different populations, but generally you start off with a TSH. But in the case of the Philippines, where uh, some of the patients have to travel very far and you cannot do a sequential testing, you often will probably end up with getting the TSH as well as the FT4 early on in your evaluation and maybe add on a ultrasound of the thyroid for you to identify uh, the pathologies that may be present among these patients. So let's put together everything that we have learned as far as thyroid function tests are concerned, and let me share with you some of my personal insights as far as this topic is concerned. 
Indeed, thyroid disease may be uh, varied in its uh, presentation. It's often the clinical signs and symptoms that are very important. But of course, your thyroid function tests also play a very important role in the diagnosis as well as the management of uh, thyroid patients. Some of them may actually be asymptomatic. The initial evaluation with sequential approach really starts with uh, TSH and more directed thyroid function tests. Uh, but consider the cost as well as the convenience for the patients in our setting. Uh, the current generation of thyroid function tests are actually very accurate in detecting abnormal levels of your thyroid hormone, but interferences may be present and you need to keep them in mind. Uh, consider also the availability because first, second, and third generation thyroid function tests may not be entirely uh, present in a lot of the situations or uh, localities that we have within the country. A combination of detailed history and, of course, complete physical examination, as well as uh, imaging and biochemical tests, will really be the best way to go in diagnosing uh, patients with thyroid disease. And as challenging thyroid function tests may be, they really will, will need a lot of understanding with many of the factors, and perhaps a referral to your endocrinologist may be of use especially if they become um, inconsistent with the presentation of the patient. So that's for the first part of this talk. We'll move on to the next part, which is really thyroid emergencies and dealing with uh, these emergencies. So essentially, when you talk about uh, thyroid emergencies, you have hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. So for hyperthyroidism, you have thyroid storm. And of course, when you talk about hypothyroidism, you have myxid coma. So they're on opposite side of the spectrum. So you talk about thyroid storm, which is relatively rare, but you know it's life-threatening. The incidents have dropped significantly because of improvements in detection of patients. And of course, the treatment of these patients. Often, uh, when we come across these patients, we now know that um, the management is pretty much state forward, and you need to really control the overproduction of your thyroid hormones. And uh, often these are precipitated by actual events or acute events that push the patient to a hyperthyroid state. The myxedema coma, on the other hand, it establishes that there was already hypothyroidism to begin with. And again, an acute event may have pushed this patient to severe hypothyroidism. So again, both of these disease entities have very high mortality rate, but if treated appropriately, and immediately, you can actually save the life of your patient. So early recognition is very important on both of these thyroid um, disorders. No? So let's begin with thyroid storm. And the incidence is quite low, 0.2 per 100,000 population. Uh, this is a manifestation of untreated or partially treated thyroid toxicosis. You see here many of the factors that may precipitate uh, thyroid storm. You have infections, which are very common. Um, acute illness no, that may be present in your patient, uh, surg non-thyroid surgery in a pre-existing hyperthyroid patient. And therefore, clearance is really very important for uh, these patients, particularly endocrine clearance. No? So for patients that stop taking their medications or are poorly compliant with their anti-thyroid medications, you may uh, put them into a very precautious state, and therefore some of them may actually be bordering around hyperthyroidism, even crossing to the point that they may have a thyroid storm. So uh, iodine, iodine contrast is also one of the possible causes that can push your patient to thyroid storm. Pregnancy and um, during labor and delivery can push patients that are existing hyperthyroid uh, into a thyroid storm, and therefore you need to control them appropriately during the peripartum period. Clinical manifestations, uh, these are history of thyroid disease, uh, goiter as well as your um, thyroid eye disease uh, manifesting with high fever, tachycardia, heart failure, tremor sweatings, and all of the likes that are shown here. Now, clinically, what we normally use is the scoring system, and the residents know this very well. You have the birch wartowski scoring system of the thyroid system that looks into the um, thermal regulation of the patient, you're also looking into the cardiovascular uh, events or um, presence of cardiovascular abnormalities. You have congenital heart failure, very prominent in, in, in this list. 
You also have gastrohepatic dysfunction, central nervous system disturbance, as well as um, precipitant history. So often when you get a patient with more than 45 score, you are labeling this patient as thyroid storm. Anything between 25 to 44 is impending storm and less than 26 with um, thyroid storm unlikely. So here you're also uh, seeing Another criteria, this is the Japanese Thyroid Association categories for thyroid storm. It's quite different in that it starts off with uh, the consideration of elevated FT3 and FT4, which is a prerequisite for the scoring system. And now for definitive or definite thyroid storm, both the elevation FT3, FT4 plus at least one of the CNS manifestation plus one or more of the symptoms that are shown here, which includes fever, tachycardia, heart failure, gastrohepatic, or a combination of many of the um, signs and symptoms sh shown here on the upper part of uh, this, per this slide. No? So suggestive if only a combination of at least two are present and the other manifestations are not um, shown in the patient. No? So these are two of the more common scoring systems that focuses on thyroid storm. Now, as far as management is concerned, if you want to look at this slide, um, this is pretty much a summary of what you need to do if you're dealing with a patient with thyroid storm. There are supportive measures that go hand in hand with specific therapy. So when you talk about supportive measures, you need to have these patients at rest with some of them mildly sedated. Uh, fluid and electrolytes, very important, as well as nutritional support because they're often um, malnourished. Oxygen therapy, as well as uh, some of the more non-specific therapy as uh, antipyretics may be needed for this patient. For specific therapy, for beta blockers, which you often would use, you need to start this early on together with your antithyroid medications. So you can use propanolol as high as 60 to 80 milligrams every four to six hours. For antithyroid medications, you have a choice between PTU and metimazole, PT, PTU with 200 milligrams every four hours. So that's roughly about four tablets every four hours, especially for life-threatening thyroid storm. For non-life-threatening thyroid storm, you can use your metimazole, 20 milligrams every five to six hours. So the difference here, of course, is PTU decreases the conversion of your FT4 to FT3, and therefore, uh, that's a very important uh, factor in favor of PTU when you're dealing with uh, severely hyperthyroid patients or patients in thyroid storm. So both your beta blocker as well as your antithyroid need to be given immediately at the time of the diagnosis at the level of the ER. So later on, about an hour after, you can use your Lugol solution, 10 drops uh, three times a day, or your SSKI, five drops every six hours. And uh, these are... Other uh, medications such as hydrocortisone or dexamethasone, hydrocortisone at 100 milligrams every eight hours for severe life-threatening hyperthyroidism, or you can use your dexamethasone two milligrams every six hours, with, although we don't often use this uh, strategy uh, primarily because um, most of the time they are controlled with the medications uh, shown above. Now, for patients that are given steroids, you need to check the blood sugar if they remain controlled, or if there are any derangements, you need to cover for that as well. Cholestyramine, which is not uh, available locally, can be used also as adjunctive therapy for treatment of um, hyperthyroidism. Your cholestyramine is a bile sequestrant, and therefore it can help eliminate your um, hyper or control your hyperthyroidism. There are other therapies that may be made available to patients. In very rare cases, plasmapheresis may be needed. Uh, you can give lithium to control the hyperthyroidism. Or in some cases, in extreme cases, you have dialysis or thyroid surgery. So this is just a summary of the beta blockers that you can actually use. In the Philippines, we use propanolol, which has a preparation of um, 10 milligrams and 40 milligrams. So you can use this, use this three to four times a day. We also have atenolol, metoprolol, and of course the IV form, which is esmolol. Uh, very rarely available here in the Philippines, but if you have it, you can use it uh, 50 to 100 micrograms per kilo per minute as a drip. So 
for the antithyroid medications. You have here PTU at uh, 500 to 1,000 milligram load, and then you taper this off to about 250. Depending on uh, the manifestation of patients, you can be more aggressive with the use of PTU over your metimazole, but metimazole is also very effective in controlling hyperthyroid patients. Both of them are antithyroid medications that, that act primarily in the, the blocking of new hormone synthesis. Now, propanolol is a beta blocker. You also have um, iodide or potassium iodide uh, to control the um, overproduction of new hormone as well as um, hydrocortisone to decrease the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. So that's for hyperthyroidism and thyroid storm. So what about myxedema coma? So when we talk about myxedema coma, again, this is a life-threatening clinical condition. Often when you see these patients, there may be a precipitating factor that may be present. So here you have burns, carbon dioxide retention, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, even infection or medications or any of the stresses that can cause a, a severe decrease in your uh, thyroid or depletion of your thyroid hormones in already depleted patients. Clinical manifestations, uh, more significant here is you see altered mentation, uh, sometimes alopecia, cardiovascular uh, manifestations with hypotension, bradycardia, gastrointestinal. Of course, you have pulmonary symptoms with hyperventilation, hypothermia, and of course, the classic uh, mixed edematous phase and non-pitting edema. So the myxedema coma also has its own scoring system. And in this scoring system, a score of more than 60 is consistent with myxedema coma, 25 to 29 risk for myxedema coma, and less than 25 unlikely to be myxedema. And of course, the key main features of myxedema is really the altered mental state, uh, defective thermal regulation with hypothermia, and the existing um, precipitating event. So the parameters that they use here, of course, thermal regulatory dysfunction. You have central nervous system uh, defect or effects. You have gastrointestinal uh, precipitating events, as well as metabolic and cardiovascular uh, dysfunctions that may be present on the patient. So in terms of management for hypothyroidism, you need to correct your low T4 by giving uh, larger doses of your levothyroxine or levothionine. Uh, so in this case, um, there are options. No? So a lot of the uh, foreign literature that I reviewed uh, tell us that we can use it IV, but in the local setting, we don't have the IV preparation for your uh, levothyroxine. And therefore, we often use the tablet form that we can give to the NGT. So you also have to treat uh, some of the concomitant medical problems that may be present in the patient, such as low cortisol, uh, low blood volume, hypothermia, hyponatremia, hypotension, uh, hypoglycemia, and of course, uh, attack the primary event that caused the whole cascade of problems for the hypothyroid patient. So here are some studies that have you know, indicated how effective your IV and oral levothyroxine uh, administration is, if you notice that uh, they have a similar um, effect in terms of uh, increasing your levothyroxine or levels or your T4 levels as shown here, and these preparations were given once a week. If you notice, the graphs here have indicated that really there's an increase already in the T4 after a few weeks treatment with your IV as well as oral levothyroxine. The IV, IV levothyroxine is about 100 micrograms. The oral levothyroxine about 1,000 to 700 micrograms. So the algorithm here uses the um, clinical grading of uh, hypothyroid patients. As you can see here, the diagnostic scoring criteria that I described earlier is used uh, to follow, uh, to manage these patients. For patients with uh, myxedema coma with a score of more than 60, then they start the treatment and they first, they will confirm with your FT4 and T3. So for no cardiovascular disease, they start off with a loading dose of 500 micrograms of uh, levothyroxine and then 
they followed this with, uh, on subsequent days with lower doses, initially at 200 micrograms for two days, followed by 150 micrograms for two days, and then taper off slowly. For those with cardiovascular uh, disease, so you may have to start off with a lower dose, about 400 micrograms levothyroxine, and then taper off to 200 micrograms per uh, after the initial day for two days, and then 150 for the next two days. And then you reach the maintenance phase of about 1.6 micrograms per kilo. Now, for those with um, low ejection fraction, you, of course, will have to start off with a lower dose of your levothyroxine. Using this strategy, you will see that um, the oral levothyroxine is as effective uh, treatment if your IV levothyroxine is not available. And the dose that I showed here is typically what they followed. No? So uh, I think these are very important numbers, particularly because we have limited resources with regard to uh, managing myxedema coma. So here, this is just a summary of uh, what we talked about in terms of uh, approaching thyroid emergencies, the initial phase of thyrotoxic storm or thyroid storm will have to start with a combination of your beta blocker plus your antithyroid. If needed, you can start off with uh, hydrocortisone as well. Second line treatment will include your Lugol solution or potassium iodide with lithium or L-carnitine, and then you can correct the uh, other derangement with supportive therapy. In selected cases, you may have to give support, uh, ventilatory support with these patients in the presence of hypoxemia. And of course, correct the hyperthermia. Now for uh, myxedema coma or hypothyroid coma, your levothyroxine or lyothionine may be needed for these patients. You don't, we don't have T3 in the Philippines. We only have LT4. Hydrocortisone may also be used, uh, particularly because hypothyroid patients may also have some sort of adrenal insufficiency. Of course, electrolytes as well as supportive treatment may be needed for a lot of these patients. And, uh, of course, try to identify what's causing or what started the whole problem to begin with. Now, um, at the end, we really have to evaluate what are the precipitating causes of uh, these patients. So often, when we're able to identify as we treat these patients and correct the derangements, we also need to correct the precipitating event. And therefore, really, there's a lot of things that you need to consider when you manage a hyper- or hypothyroid patients. So here are the, some important points of the last part of this lecture. And of course, some of my personal insights as far as uh, thyroid disease, especially in emergencies. Both your thyroid storm and mixed edema coma are rare, but really very significant complications of thyroid disease. And uh, very important to consider that uh, the results of your thyroid function test may not reflect the actual state of the patient. And you really need to look at the presentation of the patient, and of course, uh, to be able to address the problems that are being uh, presented. You know, of course, you have precipitating factors. This should also be addressed, particularly with non-compliance of medications and lack of clinical follow-up, which is often the case in our setting. For thyroid, thyroid storm, you have a combination of medications that you use to control the symptoms, as well as prevent the overproduction of thyroid hormones that are very important in its management. And in the case of mixed edema coma, the challenge really is how much to give with your levothyroxine, what preparation you have, as well as treating the primary problem. Despite these um, limitations that you encounter in thyroid emergencies, the success rate has improved significantly in the past few years. But of course, the risk for mortality for these patients may be present. With that, I end my lecture. I want to thank all of you for listening, and uh, we look forward to the questions that you're going to have in the Q&A. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone.